chapter 1. We'll actually begin our verse-by-verse study after the introduction last week. And you'll find something is interesting that the other three Gospels do not do, but Matthew chapter 1, the first chapter of the whole book, opens with a genealogy, a genealogy of Jesus Christ specifically. Now, a lot of people want to skip that when they read their Bibles. They often jump this because so-and-so begat so-and-so, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and you're kind of like, what's the point? And I'm not even going to tonight even read every verse of the, of the genealogy, but I'm going to spend some time on it. Uh, one, because God put it in there for a reason, right? The Holy Spirit guided Matthew to write this, and it's tracing uh, the Messianic promise, the seed of David. Messiah would come into this world as true humanity. He's the seed of the woman from Genesis 3.15 who will crush the head of the serpent. And the seed line never breaks all the way from Adam all the way to Jesus. And it will highlight that Jesus has a right to the Davidic throne, which is very important. So, and if I'm going to teach Matthew verse by verse, and I can't skip it. It's there. We've got to cover it. So a major reason why this study tonight is so important is because if Jesus is not a Jew from the Jewish people, the seed of Abraham, which is mentioned in Matthew 1, and he's not from the tribe of Judah in the genetic line of King David, the son and seed of David, then he has no right to rule on the throne of David, and he was not the promised king. So why do you think God puts the genealogy there? To show that this is the one you've been waiting for. Of course, Matthew writes this after Israel has rejected Messiah and the question would be, well, maybe Jesus wasn't the one. Well, the, the genealogy is there to show that he was, as well as all these other things in the book of Matthew. So if he is all these things, he has the right to rule, and he'll rule the future kingdom, and we have all made the right choice to believe in him, right? If he's not the one, then what are we doing here? Worshiping the Son of God who's not really the Son of God? Uh, Believing Jesus is the ruler of the kingdom when he's not, but he is according to the gospel of Matthew, and this genealogy will highlight that. So the gospels and even the genealogies, because there's one in Luke, validate in every way that Jesus is the predicted king from the Hebrew scriptures. So you'll need a Hebrew Bible or an Old Testament, obviously translated in English for us, to look at those prophecies and does Jesus line up with those? So there, there are two important genealogies in the Gospels, one in Matthew chapter 1 and then one in Luke chapter 3. So we're going to talk about these tonight, some fascinating things about them and some things maybe you haven't thought of. Uh, one scholar put it this way, <clears throat> with the genealogies you have the four sonships of the Messiah. The first sonship is the son of David. That means that Jesus is a king. More specifically, the Messianic king. See, the son of David looks to the ultimate son in the line of David genetically, and that's Jesus, and David was a king, right? Well, one in his line will be the ultimate king. Also, son of Abraham, Jesus is a Jew. At the end of Luke's version in Luke 3.38, two more sonships are revealed. The son of man or Adam, meaning he's human, and then the son of God, meaning he's God. So we, I like this. When you put the four sonships together, son of David, Abraham, Adam, and God, you have the Messianic Jewish God-man king. <laughs> I like that. And that's what you have. Um, so there is a debate concerning which of the two genealogies is the genealogy of Joseph or the genealogy of Mary. Now, I went online just to get a genealogy chart and I, I found two of them, and uh, one has it one way, the other has it the other way. So what you'll see, I, I know it's hard to read some of these names, but you have the genealogy. Of course, Luke takes you all the way back to Adam, son of God, and it does it in reverse. But here, here are the names in the genealogy, and I, uh, I, both slides have, have those same uh, names. But if you notice on this slide, 
This slide sees Luke 3, 23 through 38 as the line of Joseph, right? And you can see it. I have it. It's sideways. I know it's hard to read, but... And then below, you can see they have the genealogy of Matthew 1 as the line of Mary. Now, is Mary mentioned in Matthew 1? Yeah. From whom Mary, the Messiah, came. But I think, I, I don't think this is correct, um, in the way this, this particular slide has it. Now, the chart on this slide sees Luke 3, 23 through 38 as the line of Mary, and Matthew 1 as the line of Joseph. Now, I personally hold this view, and I'll continue to develop this and validate this in, uh, during this message. So let's kind of get a big picture here. <clears throat> so when you study the two genealogies, they demonstrate that Jesus has the right to the Davidic throne. Okay, so here you have the lineage of Davidic descent in both genealogies of, uh, of Mary and of Joseph. I think Luke is highlighting Mary. So all the way back to David, which he goes all the way. Isn't he a descendant of Adam? I mean, he's a human being. Adam was the first man, so we all come from Adam. Our family tree goes all the way back to one man. So David is highlighted here. So you have the Davidic covenant of 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16, which promised a king in his line. Um, and so when you go up top, remember David had two sons we, we know of for sure. Nathan is one of them, and Solomon, the king that ruled after David. After David ruled 40 years, Solomon took his place. And you'll see that when you go through kings. So you have Nathan and Solomon... Now, when you go back up top, Nathan would eventually go to the line of Mary, then to Jesus. So that's the legitimate line of Davidic descent. Uh, but then when you go down below, David's son Solomon would be the line of Joseph. Um, now, they're son, both are sons of David, but there's a problem with Solomon's line, and I highlighted it. You can see uh, Jeconiah. Can you read that? Is it big enough? Uh, or Coniah, he's also called. And there was a, a curse on Jeconiah. It's actually revealed in uh, Jeremiah 22, 24 through 30. And this pre-exilic king called Coniah or Jeconiah was cursed by God because of his sinful character. So the curse stated that no descendant of Coniah could sit on David's throne. You can just go read Jeremiah sometime, 20 chapter 22, 24 through 30, and you'll see that the king cannot come from that line. So since Joseph was a descendant of Coniah, he's also disqualified from the throne. And if Jesus was truly the son of Joseph, which he was only his, what? That was his stepfather. Joseph didn't have sex with Mary to get Jesus. Jesus would then be disqualified. So Matthew's genealogy highlights that Jesus could not sit on the throne of David if he was the son of Joseph. And then if you look at um, a statement in Luke 3.31, even Luke's genealogy makes it clear that Jesus comes through not Solomon, but Nathan, right? 3.31, the son of Malaya, the son of Mena, the son of... Uh, Matatha, and then the son of Nathan, the son of David. So David had a son named Nathan, and through that line will come eventually Mary, then Jesus will be born a virgin birth uh, through Mary. Dr. Frutenbaum, and he's done a lot of work on the genealogies, more, th more than I know of anyone I've studied under, so I'll use some of his material tonight for sure. He says, in essence, Matthew's point is this. If Jesus was really Joseph's son, he could not claim to sit on David's throne because of the Jeconiah curse. Then Matthew proceeds to show that Jesus was not truly Joseph's son, for he was born of the Virgin Mary, 118 through 25. And I'll show you in the Greek language how specific it is that he came from Mary and not Joseph, from grammar, which you cannot see in uh, English Bibles. So other reasons to see Luke's genealogy is the line of Mary. And, and some at this point say, I, as long as he's the Messiah in the right line, I'm good. But you'd be amazed at the debate. 
uh, on this. And even Jews that have not come to faith in Christ will use the genealogies to say why they don't. So it's helpful to know. So another reason why I think Luke's genealogy is tracing Mary, or the line of Mary. Now, if you want to trace a woman's line, according to Jewish law, you would use the name of the husband. You understand? Uh, they didn't use a woman's, a woman's name unless it was for some particular reason. I mean, does Matthew have women recorded in it? Yeah, but if you want to trace a woman's line, you would use the name of the husband. That's the way the Jews did it. But if the husband's name is being used, how would you know for sure if it's the genealogy of the husband or the wife? Do you understand? That's a good question. Well, one way to know this is through the use of the de definite article in the Greek language. So um, in English, it's not good grammar to put an article in front of a proper name, right? Hello, the Mark. Hello, the Jaime. You know, and start naming people by their, with a definite article. It doesn't sound right. Hello, the David, the Mary, the John. But in, Gre in the Greek language, it's acceptable. So in Luke's genealogy... Every single name has the definite article, except the name Joseph. And I'm going to show you that. Okay, there's the... Now, there's the Greek of Luke 3, 23, all the way to Adam, the son of God. <clears throat> and I'll get to this in a little more detail in just a second. So when the definite article is missing, this would indicate that it's the line of the wife, not the husband. So because of the missing article with the name Joseph, the reader of Luke's genealogy would conclude this, this is Mary's genealogy and not Joseph's. So what I did in color to help you, can you see the difference between the blue and the red? Is that clear enough? On my computer, it's real clear, but these screens sometimes lose a little color distinction. So if you look at Luke 3.23, when Jesus began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. See, he's not the biological father of Joseph, um, as was assumed. But notice it says Joseph, son of Eli, and then goes on and on and on, right? Son of this, son of this, of this, of this. So Joseph is in, in, uh, highlighted in red, and in the Greek, you, can you see it there down below? And then... Look how many times you see that blue. It look, does it look like in English, two, T-O-U? Well, that's the definite article, and every single name has the article. You can go all the way through it and see it. But who doesn't have one? There's not, not one before Joseph. So that's very true. There's an article in front of every name except Joseph, and <clears throat> some argue, like Arnold Fruchtenbaum, that this is highlighting. It's really highlighting the woman's line, not the man. which would be within Jewish custom. There's also a unique feature of Luke's genealogy. It's in reverse. It, it goes backwards all the way to Adam. So Jesus' physical line goes all the way back to the first man, Adam in the garden. And so I, I, I know I skipped some names there, but you can see Jesus, the Son of God, uh, and then all the way... Uh, it's his uh, talking about him being the ultimate descendant, and then it goes back to Joseph, and then it'll hit David, Jesse, Boaz, Judah, Jacob, then Abraham, remember, and then Shem, he came from Shem, and then Noah, and then Seth, and then Seth was one of Adam's sons, and then Adam is the son of God. It says of him, son of God. So we understand that Jesus is the son of God, but in what sense is Adam the son of God? Right? I mean, God, uh, God didn't bring Adam through procreation like everybody in that line. He actually created Adam from the dust of the ground, the first man, and then he breathed life into him, Genesis 2-7. So the first man didn't have a biological father, but did he have a heavenly father? And sonship has the idea of also representation. Uh, just like a, a genetic, a father of his son who's a genetic relation to him, he still wants his son to represent him, right? And God wants his children to represent him, and Adam was to do that. 
So in the garden, God created man out of the dust, breathed life into him, and he was his primary representative, remember, in his image, it says, who was to rule on the earth. So he was in God's image, Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Uh, the image of God can also refer to an obedient image. I know man is the only creature that uniquely reflects God in his person, in his makeup. But there's also, there's three uses of image. There's a, there, one of them is the representative view, that Adam was to represent God in his image, meaning he's to represent the sovereign. They call it a suzerain vassal treaty. The suzerain was the great king uh, in the land, and then the vassal nations had to submit to him or else they were punished terribly. And so even God is the suzerain over is Israel, and Israel is his vassal nation to represent him according to his word. And when Israel sins, what happens? They get punished. Uh, one of the things the suzerain would, would give to the vassal is land. They call them royal grants. And if the suzerain obeyed, I'm sorry, if the vassal obeyed the great king, then they could enjoy the land. But if they didn't, he'd send in his armies and take them out. Well, what did God do to Israel? When they disobeyed, he said, I'll send the nations against you to drive you out of the land. So I even think the Israelites were under this suzerain-vassal relationship. But Adam was the vassal of God. He was to represent God. Some would call him the vicegerent. And he was to do so according to God's word and nothing else, obey him. And what did he do? He disobeyed a direct command in Genesis 2.17 to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now he's kicked out of the land. And the, and the angels with flaming swords blocked his way to the tree of life. So Adam was to what? Take dominion. He was to rule, rule and take dominion over the earth. So if he's a ruler, what is he? He's a king. Who we, but he failed, right? So who are we waiting for? The ultimate representative king who never sinned, never failed, who will rectify everything that Adam brought to us through his sin. And again, it's not going to be through human rulers as we've seen for centuries. It's not going to be through the, any president we elect. You just got to elect the best one for the day. But he's, he's not God. He's not going to fix it all. Um, so we have good rulers and bad rulers, but we're waiting for the perfect ruler who never has a bad day or ever makes a bad decision. So Jesus <clears throat> is actually the eternal Son of God who becomes flesh. Remember the Word becomes flesh, John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.14. 1, and He comes through the physical line recorded in the genealogy and will rule the earth in the future as God's perfect representative King. So this is big picture stuff that's very helpful. It makes the Bible more simple. You see where the first representative king failed. Well, history is waiting for the ultimate one who came and the genealogy shows, hey, this was the one and you missed him, but he'll come back to rule the kingdom. Um, as we look at Revelation, we'll see, as we did recently, we see Jesus coming back on the white horse and what is he called? King of kings. It's a superlative. He's the greatest one of all, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he establishes his kingdom after he, de he defeats the enemy when he returns to the earth. Even when Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan, remember that story? You see it in uh, Matthew 3 and Luke 3. And this is after John had told Israel, the nation, to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the, John's not the king, but he's pointing to the one who can rule. God the Father said from heaven, remember? Remember? He comes up out of the water, and behold, a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So the Father is specifying that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant in a kingdom context, namely the ultimate Son of God in the line of David. So backing up, you see to the right of the screen, Psalm 2, 6, and 7, God says, I have yet installed my king on Zion. So Jesus will rule in Jerusalem on Zion. Today I have begotten you, um, I'm sorry, you are my son. So the Davidic son, uh, the one in the line of David, I have begotten you. And then uh, John 1.49, um, one of the disciples says, you're the son of God, 
You're the king of Israel. See what he put in parallel? The son of God with the kingship. And I think that's what's going on at the baptism. So Jesus is in the line of Adam, according to this genealogy. The first man God ever created, with Jesus being the what? We have the first Adam, second Adam, or we could say the last Adam. He's called both. Who is the ultimate representative man, capital M, who will rule the earth. Uh, Dr. Fairbairn adds this. He says, while Jesus is to Matthew the Messiah, he is to Luke the second Adam, the creator and head of the new humanity, sustaining universal relations and accomplishing a universal work. So this second Adam idea, do you know where it's found? 1 Corinthians 15. If someone says he's never called the second Adam or the last Adam, I'll show this to you. Go, to, go over there to 1 Corinthians 15. It's going to be a little later in the chapter. The beginning of the chapter, Paul talks about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And how he appeared to many after his resurrection. And at one time, he appeared to over 500. They're all eyewitnesses. And so the point of the chapter is that he had to be bodily resurrected or we're all still dead in our sins. So this is probably one of the best chapters in all the Bible to prove bodily resurrection. So if you go to 1 Corinthians 15, 42, in this very long argument, Paul mentions the resurrection of the dead. In 42, he says, it is sown a perishable body, it's raised an imperishable body. So don't we have a body that's perishing? It's, it's aging and it's not going to last forever. This vehicle um, will wear out. But it will be raised an imperishable body. So we will be bodily resurrected. And the body you have now that's fallen, he's going to take that body and make it perfect. He doesn't throw that one away and start over with new materials. A bodily resurrection means he takes this body just like Jesus' body was in the tomb. And that body came out. But it'll be a glorified body like his. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. So there's resurrection. It's sown in weakness, but raised in power. So God's going to be the power behind the resurrection. It is sown a natural body, but it's raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, then there's also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, who is that? It says, Adam. He became a, a, a living soul. That's Genesis 2-7. After God breathed life into him, uh, as he took him from the dust of the ground, he became a living being. The last Adam, that's there, see, that's Jesus, the ultimate representative, became a life-giving spirit. See, Jesus came to give life, and he came to give it abundantly. He is the source of life because he is life. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one can come to the Father but through me. He says, however, in verse 46, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth. So there's Adam in the garden. Earthy, he says. The second man is from heaven. That's Jesus Christ, the God-man, who came from heaven and became flesh. Uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.14. So Jesus is called the last Adam. He's also called the second man. You know what the Hebrew word for man is? Adam, Adam. So he's, he's the second Adam. I remember a scholar saying once, Jesus is never called the second Adam. Well, yeah, the second man. It's the same thing. <clears throat> so there's some other interesting features of the two genealogies. For example, in Matthew's genealogy, there's the mention of certain women. He does mention women, which is very uh, peculiar to do so in the way he does it, especially by, by the way, or the, the women he mentioned. <laughs> so, Frutenbaum says this, he says, and by the way, you see that little book in the corner there? Uh, it's, that's what it looks like. It's kind of a handbook. It's really, it's big, paperback, and... Um, it's called Messianic Christology, and it traces the Messiah from Genesis through Malachi to Jesus. 
And then as a, in his appendix, he has some really good, interesting stuff, which the genealogy material came from that appendix. So you ought to, you ought to get the book anyway. It's a great tool. Uh, the first time I really started learning to trace the Messiah, this is the, one of the first books somebody gave me, and it revolution, revolutionized the way I looked at the Old Testament uh, as the background for the new. Very helpful in that. So he says, Matthew breaks with Jewish tradition in two ways, and that he skips names and mentions the names of women. Matthew mentions four different women in his genealogy, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Tamar. He says, why does he mention these four women when there's so many other prominent Jewish women he could have mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus? How about Sarah? Hey, Sarah needs to make this genealogy. No, she doesn't. One thing all four women have in common was that they were all Gentile. Interesting, a Jewish genealogy has Gentile women. He says what Matthew was doing by naming these four women and no others was to point out that one of the purposes of the coming of Jesus was to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but Gentiles also benefit from his coming. He says three of these women were guilty of sexual sins. One was guilty of adultery. Who was that? Bathsheba with David. One was guilty of prostitution, Rahab the prostitute. One was guilty of incest, Tamar from Genesis 38. Ruth herself was not guilty of any sexual sin, but she did originate from one. Being a Moabitess means she originated from the incestuous relationship between Lot and one of his daughters. So you, you look at the destruction of Sodom by God when he sends in the messengers, the two angels, and they bring Lot out. Uh, at the end of Genesis 19, 36 and 37, it mentions the line of the uh, Moabite. So she was a Moabitess, and it came from Lot and, and one of his daughters he had sexual relationships with, a sexual relationship with. So again, he says, Matthew begins hinting at a point he makes quite clear later, which is that the purpose of the coming of the Messiah was to save sinners. Luke, however, will, will follow strict Jewish law procedure and custom, and that he'll skip no names nor mention any women's names. You know, one woman is mentioned in Luke's genealogy, and he doesn't skip names like Matthew does. So why does Matthew skip names and divide it into 14s? I'll show you that in a minute, or at least a suggestion. J.W. Shepard, in his book, The Christ of the Gospel, said this, Matthew punctures, I love this, he punctures the pride of his Jewish brethren by inserting the names which they in their hypocritical self-righteousness would have repudiated, some suggestive of disgrace, others of apostasy and covenant breaking. Where did he get the idea that the Jewish brethren were arrogant? That's a joke. I mean, if you just read the Gospels and, and how they treated Jesus and all their self-righteousness, you'll see that. He says these proud Pharisaic brethren had recently rejected Jesus as unworthy and, and meriting death, but he was superior to the best of the forefathers, even the royal line, to say the least. So Matthew just, he just let it go. I mean, God, the Holy Spirit's directing him to do that, I think, to highlight the Jewish pride and, and to show other things by including these women. So another unique feature of the genealogies is found in Matthew. Um, I don't know how clear that is. I think that should be clear enough. So Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, it says, The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. And that's a whole subject in and of itself, because was there an anointed one predicted in the Old Testament? Because weren't kings anointed by a prophet? I mean, David was anointed by Samuel. And G uh, who's the ultimate anointed one in the line of David? Jesus. And who anointed him? John the Baptist was a prophet. But he watches God anoint him with the Holy Spirit and then hears God say, that's the son. So it says, the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then in verse 17, I'm jumping down there. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, underscore 14, from David to the deportation of Babylon. That's when they went into captivity. 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon and Messiah, 
14 generations. So some argue that the division of the names in Matthew's genealogy also highlights Jesus of being of Davidic descent. And since the names are divided into three groups with 14 names each, and David's name in Hebrew numerology adds up to 14, this emphasizes that Jesus is the promised king in the line of David. Now, some don't believe that, but a lot of people do. And um, <clears throat> Frutenbaum is one of them. I think Dwight Pentecost is another. And so in Hebrew, they didn't use vowel points. I mean, they used vowel points later in history. They spoke the vowels, but they didn't write vowels. They just was a consonantal text. So the Masoretes would come along later to preserve the pronunciation of the words and put these dots and dashes underneath the letters. Not even in between. They don't want to mess with the text, right? Uh, so you see a David. It, it reads right to left. What's under the first letter? It looks like a T. That's a vowel. And then you have the next Vav. I call it the upside down hockey stick. You think of that. And then there's a dot under there. And then the D again, the Dalit. So Dawid. And so there's a numerical value assigned to each letter. Uh, so the, the Dalit, the D sound, is uh, equivalent to the number four, and then the Vav in the middle is equivalent to six. So what do you got? Fourteen. And they think the Holy Spirit is guiding Matthew to even highlight Davidic descent in the structure. Uh, Dr. Pentecost said this. He says, Matthew's division of the genealogy into three groups, each with 14 names, may be significant. Matthew focuses attention on the Davidic descent of Jesus in a subtle way. In Hebrew, there are no vowels written, so David's name would be written DVD. Each letter had a numerical significance, as the Hebrews use the alphabet in counting. For example, in their system, D equals 4, V would equal 6. Thus, the letters in David's name total 14. Hence, Matthew lists 14 names in each of the three groups, reminding anyone familiar with Hebrew numerology that Jesus is of Davidic descent. I mean, all you need are the words itself. It, it tells you, but the structure may be doing the same. I hold to that myself. But even the Gospel of Luke, when you get to chapter, or back in chapter 1, before the genealogy, it says that Jesus has the right to rule on David's throne. Uh, Luke 1.30, the angel that appears to her says, Mary, don't be afraid. Um, he says, for you have found favor with God. So Mary gets to actually give birth to the seed. All these women in history in the line of Judah, wouldn't they want to be that one? Um, but Mary gets that privilege. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Now watch what it says in 32 and 33 about Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. I mean, David was uh, his father in descent way back there, but it's, he's still in the line of David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. So he's a king, and he'll reign over the eternal dynasty, and his kingdom will have no end. So he rules an eternal kingdom, and that's exactly what the Davidic covenant, covenant promised in 2 Samuel 7. An eternal descendant, an eternal house, an eternal kingdom with an eternal king that sits on an eternal throne. Dr. Pentecost again said, Matthew was concerned with Messiah in relation to Israel, while Luke was concerned with Messiah in relation to the entire human race. And that's why I think he traces it even back to Adam. Even before the Jews became a Jewish people, there were still, what, men of the nations, the Gentiles. So according to the Old Testament, Messiah would not only rule over Israel, but over all nations. He was to be the world's Messiah as well as Israel's. In keeping with this theme, Luke traced the genealogy of Jesus to Adam, the head of the human race. In spite of all the problems that the two genealogies present, and I'm just kind of scratching the surface on these uh, genealogies, he said, in spite of all that, we must not lose sight of the fact that they present inconvertible, in, uh, incontrovertible proof that Jesus is the son of Abraham, the son of David, the one through whom God will bring the great covenants he made with Israel to their conclusion. He is the one that has the right to redeem, uh, redeem and reign. <clears throat> Good comment by Dr. Pentecost. So go to Matthew 1, verse 1. I'm doing better on time than I thought.
So Matthew 1.1, the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, so here he's called the, the, the Christos, uh, he's Jesus the Messiah, the anointed one, son of David, the son of Abraham. That's how the whole book starts. And see, it's, it's highlighting Jesus the king. That's why he starts this book with the genealogy of the king. When John wants to highlight Jesus as God, what does he do? First verse in John, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. I mean, he just states his deity right there. So sometimes right at the beginning of a, of a book, you can see a purpose forming. <clears throat> so by, by mentioning Abraham, it highlights that Jesus was a Jew and he had to be Jewish and also highlights the Abrahamic covenant. And God made a covenant with Abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through Abraham's seed, right? Who is Abraham's seed? Jesus or Israel? I love y'all. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Um, but it can refer to both, and I'll show you here in a second why. So the Abrahamic covenant, you'll see it in all through Genesis, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 15, 17, 22. And then it's even highlighted to Jacob and then, uh, or I'm sorry, Isaac, uh, G Genesis 26, and then Jacob in Genesis 28 with Jacob's ladder. Um, he reveals the land promise and the covenant. <clears throat> so you have the Abrahamic covenant promised three things, land, seed, and blessing. It's a pretty easy way to remember it. So Israel would inherit a land, and Jesus will rule in that land in his kingdom. And then there's the seed portion of the promise, which is uh, um, there's an individual and national seed. And through Israel will come Jesus through the line of David. So the Davidic covenant highlights the seed. And then you have the worldwide blessing, <coughs> which is found in the new covenant. When Jesus rules, he'll rule Israel and Judah in the kingdom. Jeremiah 31, 34 through, thir I'm sorry, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. So by mentioning Jesus being the son of David in verse 1, it also highlights the Davidic covenant. Again, 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16, which Luke 1, um, that passage we just read, it says all of these things. So it's also found in 1 Chronicles 17, 11 through 14, and Psalm 89 is the poetic version. So David and his line, God said, would have an eternal seed, an eternal throne, eternal kingdom, eternal house or dynasty, which is a series of rulers from the same family. That line cannot break. If David's line broke and he just substituted what a guy from Benjamin on the throne, can't do that. Not going to work. And when Saul was ruling as king, the one they wanted and God allowed them to have a king of their own choosing, what tribe was he from? Benjamin. So we already have a problem with him. Now you have to pick one from, from the line of Judah because in Genesis 49.10, it says the scepter, the king's scepter, will not depart from Benjamin? No, from Judah. From between his feet until Shiloh comes, and that's the Messiah who has the right to rule, and that would be Jesus. So go to Genesis 22. Uh, I'm going to back up here. Remember I said in the covenant, there's a seed, but even in the Abrahamic covenant, that seed is individual and national. So through Abraham's seed, all the nations will be blessed. So even Gentiles will be blessed through Jesus Christ. But Jesus comes from the nation Israel, right? He's got to be a Jew and one tribe from that nation, Judah. So if you go to Genesis twenty two seventeen, the context is when Abraham is willing to offer his son Isaac as a, as a sacrifice and God stops him and, and uses a substitute animal, a ram, in his place. <clears throat> but God tells Abraham in Genesis twenty two seventeen, and watch the grammar carefully. 
God says to Abraham, I will indeed greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and the sand which is on the seashore. Your seed will possess the gate of his enemies. Okay, back up. The first half says, I will multiply your seed. Now, in Hebrew, the word seed all through the text only occurs in the singular. We could put an S on our word seed, right? You could say seed or seeds. And Hebrew is only occurring in the singular. So how do you know if this is a collective singular, a bunch of seed, or just one singular Sing seed context? Now, I know from context, if he's going to multiply Abraham's seed like the stars of the heavens and the sand of the seashore, that's a lot of people, right? So that's going to be national, Israel. But then in the Hebrew of the second line, it says, in your seed, again, the singular, shall possess the gate of, how many of you have their enemies, plural, their enemies? Anyone have that translation? Okay, it's singular in Hebrew. Shame on them for the there. If you look it up, uh, the little pronoun, it's the upside down hockey stick with a holum, a little dot above it. That's a singular masculine pronoun. His. His enemies. So a lot of guys say when Paul says in Galatians 3.16, um, when he gave the promise to Abraham, he's not talking about seeds, plural, but as to many, but one seed, and that is Christ. Well, there's the one seed that he told to Abraham. So God promised out of the national seed that he will multiply, and he did do that, didn't he? And there's, are there any Jews left on the planet? There are tons of them. But the Messianic seed will be the, the victor because he'll possess the gate of his enemies. So to possess the gate of your enemies in the ancient world means you overpower them. And that's what Jesus will do. He'll defeat the enemy and then bring Israel into the land and establish his kingdom. So the national seed will be blessed by the Messianic seed. So Jesus is also highlighted as the seed of David in Romans 1 that we recently studied. In Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul says, a, a bondservant of Christ Jesus called an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. See, there's the Davidic son. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Concerning his son who was born a descendant or the seed of David according to the flesh. So he's genetically related to David through Nathan, through Mary who was declared Son of God with power by His resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness. Clearly, it's Jesus Christ our Lord who is that descendant. So let's continue in the genealogy. Should we just read it in Greek for fun? Well, those are, that's one, Matthew 1, 2 through 16. So again, verse 2, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. So you see the Jewish line, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then it keeps going on all the way through. Um, remember, he mentions some of these women. There's Tamar in verse 3. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna, oh, there's Rahab, the other woman he mentions in verse 5. And then you have Ruth also mentioned, the Moabitess. And then, in, uh, uh, and then it talks about Oved being the father of Jesse. So when, um, when Ruth has a child with the Jewish man Boaz, they have the son Oved, which is, means one who serves. And then Oved would eventually be the father of Jesse, and Jesse is the father of King David. So verse 6, Jesse was the father of David the king, and then David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, so the adulterous relationship, um, uh, that son would die, but he would eventually with Bathsheba have Solomon, who had been the wife of Uriah. Remember, David murdered her, him, excuse me, to cover up the adultery with her. And so it keeps going down and, and tracing the genealogy. So it talks about Solomon in verse 7, but go down to um, verse 11, Josiah became the father of who? Jeconiah, there's Coniah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. So the Coniah or Jeconiah curse of Je Jeremiah 22 will keep the line from coming through Joseph. So the Jeconiah is highlighted for that reason. 
And then after the deportation of Babylon, verse 12, you have the line continues. And then you go all the way to verse 16. And that's on the slide above. It says, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. They were, right? But they had that relationship. By whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. Now, I highlighted Mary in yellow, and then the little phrase after that, ex haste, because there's a reason grammatically why this points to Mary and not Joseph. So when you read this, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, from whom Jesus was born. From, from who? But it could be from Joseph, from whom? Highlighting Joseph's line? I think it's Mary's the one highlighted here. And I'll show you why. So we're back to this slide. I just have a different background. Which do you like better, the white or the... Some of these backgrounds are easier to read on this screen than others. But So again, you have David and then Nathan and Solomon, the two sons of David. And then the, the uh, I think you have Mary, then Jesus highlighted. It says it in Matthew, but it's really Luke is highlighting Mary's line. And then you have Solomon, but you can't have the line coming through him because of the Jeconiah or Coniah curse. So that's Ixnade. And clearly we know that uh, Jesus will be the son of Nathan, the son of David. He's going to come from that line. And then you get this. Now I want to highlight this from whom idea. So the name Mary is in the feminine singular. To get more specific, the genitive feminine singular. Uh, the genitive isn't really important for me tonight on this. It's the fact that Mary's a feminine noun, right? Now, from whom in Greek, you can make this masculine or feminine. So what he does, he writes this from whom this relative pronoun is in the feminine singular, also genitive. So who does it allude to, Joseph or Mary? The grammar is pointing back to Mary in the feminine gender, therefore highlighting that Jesus, the seed of David, genetically came through Mary and not Joseph. Joseph is the legal father, but he's not the biological father. Jesus actually comes out of Mary's womb, but it's a, it's a product of the Holy Spirit who provides for the pregnancy. It's a virgin pregnancy. Jesus is virgin born. And there's some reasons for that too. So Jesus comes from the right line through Mary all the way back to Nathan. Because a Jew would say, oh, he can't come from Solomon's line because of the Coniah curse. Well, this solves that. The two genealogies put together, you can see that he didn't come from Solomon's line, even though Solomon's the legal father. Well, as I stated at the beginning of the message, a major reason why this study today is important is because if Jesus is not a Jew, the seed of Abraham, and he's not in the line of Judah through King David, the son of David, then he has no right to rule on the throne of David, and he's not the promised king. But if all this is true about him, as we've studied, he's going to rule the future kingdom, and again, we made the correct choice to believe in him because we will rule with him. Now, doesn't Revelation 5.10 say that? At the resurrection, we will reign with him. So the Gospels, even the genealogies, validate that Jesus is the predicted king from the Old Testament. So you made the right choice. Let's worship the king and continue to do so as we wait to worship him face to face in the future. So what we'll do next week in remembrance of this slide, keep your eyes on the seed. Because the genealogies do. God is tracking the seed for us. He knows what he's doing. And he's proving Jesus is that one they've been waiting for for centuries. Even the seed of the woman from Genesis 3.15. And so what we'll do next week, we're going to track the seed starting in Genesis and go that way and then get to Jesus again. Um, if this is the book about the king and the seed and Jesus being the rightful ruler, we need to focus on this. And I've done a lot of studies on the kingdom and past studies uh, in the pulpit here, and they're recorded. But if I don't do it in the Gospel of Matthew the book about the genealogy of the king and the kingship of Jesus and all that, I'm, I'm not doing a good job. So I want to have it here too. And we haven't reviewed that in a little while, so it'll be nice to do. <clears throat> so 
your homework, read Genesis to Matthew 1. And see how many things you can see about the seed woven through all that Hebrew Scripture. And uh, you'll see it if, you, if you're reading carefully. Um, think you can read all that in one, one week? <laughs> I don't think I could. But you get my point. Well, I'll do it for you, and then um, I'm going to try to do it in order, too. Because I always tell you, read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you'll see it unfold. I got a second to give you my, my saning argument. Um, which I think is helpful to, for people to hear occasionally and be reminded of it. Because people say, you sure jump around. I've had it as a complaint over 18 years. Well, okay, I'm jumping from this book to this book in order. Like, that's a bad thing? I mean, didn't the genealogy just do that? Talk about jumping around. Uh, Matthew even skips names, but he's pointing to a purpose. And so, um, and I did this in uh, high school, they called it saning, S-E-I-N-I-N-G, saning. It's, it's kind of like fishing, but you don't use a pole. You get one guy with a pole, a wooden pole, and you're on the other end holding a pole, and there's a big net between you. And so you get in a, a shallow body of water, and you just drag it through, right? Kind of like when they're trying to find a body in a river or something. They just, they're dredging it to find it, and they see what they can pull up. Um, but we did it down in, uh, around the Bay Area, down near Galveston, because uh, we were setting up aquariums in science class, so we were going to go get some stuff to put in them. Of course, uh, this teacher didn't know anything about keeping saltwater fish. They're all going to, everything died within a week. You can't do it that way. If you've ever had saltwater fish, which I did as a kid, you can't do that. But we brought some fish back or anything we could get in the net. And uh, the net has holes in it, right? I mean, you've got to let water go through. If it was solid, it wouldn't work very well. So you have holes in the net, and usually pretty tight. If, you, if they're tight, you want to get more stuff, right? If you want just huge fish, it, doesn't, it can be this big. So you, you pull it through, and then you see what you get after you walk about 40 yards, and you look and say, hey, we got some stuff. And then you may go back through. And I think that's what we have to do with the Bible. You've got to start saying back in Genesis 1, and just start pulling it through, and eventually you'll get to Revelation, and then you open your net and go, what'd you get? And God's like, yeah, you got some. Hey, that's good truths. You're seeing a pattern, but boy, did you miss a lot. The holes in your net must be this big right? But as you mature, I think the, an analogy, the holes get tinier, and you're starting to mature and understand things, and now as you go through the Bible, you're catching a lot more. I still miss stuff all the time, but my, I think the holes in the net are getting smaller, and I'm starting to see as I go through, oh, wait a minute, that's that, that's that, that connects to that. And I guess the goal is to get your, the net holes the size of pantyhose, right? Or you catch almost everything you're going through. Water still gets through, but you're catching a lot, and I'm not there yet, <laughs> but I'm working on that because I want to know. And you see the Bible is really God's story unfolding, highlighting only th the things in 66 books, which must be clearly enough for us to, be under to understand God, right? Because how many other things could he have revealed? He's leaving, he, he, I always say this, he gave us a piece of his mind, of his eternal mind. And he, all scriptures God breathed and profitable, and um, to fully equip every man for every good work. So what's in the Bible is sufficient for us to track everything we need to know. It doesn't always satisfy all of our curiosities, but um, it tells us everything we need. So you can never sane too much or gain too much. You can never study the Bible too deeply. And by not doing it, you really miss a lot of um, jewels that could be picked up in your net. And some are basically telling me, well, my net holes must be this big, and I'm okay with that because I'm doing okay. I got a good job. I got food on the table, and I think that's the wrong attitude to take. Um, I, th I think God wants more of us than that. He wants us to study the Scriptures deeply and know Him better. So that's what we'll work on next week. We'll sane with the goal of uh, tracking the seed. Um, if you pick some other stuff along the way that hits in your net, good. Um, I always find it funny when I've repeated myself in the pulpit 30 times and somebody walks up who's been here a long time and says, hey, did you get this? Did you see that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't criticize them or anything or make fun of them, but maybe they were just trying to keep up with me and lost me here and they were still thinking about something else. And, but over time, they kept seeing it and then it stuck. And uh, I'm, again, I miss stuff all the time. 
And that's why it's important to repeat because some people need to hear it over and over and then it will finally stick. And so when they do see something like that, I'm always very happy because I sure don't get it all the first time myself. And then we may talk a little bit about, uh, in some detail, the virgin birth after tracking the seed because Jesus was specifically from Mary who was a virgin. And how can a virgin be with child who's never had relations with a man? Well, the Holy Spirit provided for that, so we'll look at that too. But uh, let's pray. Mm. Yeah, she was having some trouble, so. Okay. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we just want to lift up an urgent prayer request to you for B. And uh, Lord, you, you know all things and you knew what was going to happen, but we just pray you guide her to the, the right doctors and, and, and they will come up with a solution to help her that she would be restored to us. And so Lord, uh, give that family comfort as they, as they look on in, in a difficult situation and give them the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. And may the Holy Spirit guide all of this to a, a result of good health. And again, we thank you for tonight, encouraging us that Jesus is the right one to believe in, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God who will rule. So thank you for, again, reminding us of in whom we've believed and how, <clears throat> how we made the right choice. And we never need to look back or look to anyone else but Jesus Christ, our Savior. In his name we pray, amen.